Let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We take just a moment of silence to call to mind the presence of the Lord and our cell phones. I hope mine's on silent. It's probably not. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many gifts you've given us in our lives. Just the gift of having another day in this life is itself something that we probably take for granted far too often. We thank you for the gift of your church. We thank you for the gift of this holy, sacred season of Lent through which you call us to become more purified from our earthly desires, our earthly wants so that we can become more attached just to you and to your will. Help us to dive ever more deeply into this holy season of Lent, Lord. Strip us of all of the things that are holding us back from you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, I was asked to present this year on Living Lent... And also the scrutinies. We're going to talk about what the scrutinies are here in just a second. <clears throat> but just a quick overview. The scrutinies are really, it's the first, third, first, second, and third scrutiny, but those are actually the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays, of, or fourth, fifth, anyway, Sundays of Lent. I always get the numbers confused. So anyway, we're not in any of the scrutinies right now. We'll see later on how those tie into the Sundays of Lent, okay? So... Tonight, we're going to be talking about what Lent is, uh, but not just academically what Lent, what Lent is, but how can we more deeply dive into living Lent, living Lent, all right? And I, I'm going to try to, I tend to babble, and so I'm sorry, but I'm going to try to leave room at the end for questions. I don't think we're doing table discussions tonight, so, uh, so no table discussions, even though I spent at least two hours just preparing the questions for the small table group discussion. I mean, I worked them and reworked them and reworked them, and then I printed them off, and I was like, I don't like that font. I'm going to try something different. And here I am today, not even able to use them. So it's just very sad. I'm living Lent right now. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, so no table discussion. So I, I, I do plan to try to leave some room at the end for questions or comments, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Uh, one thing I do want to say, piggybacking off what Patty mentioned at the at kind of leading us into this, uh, we are going to be talking about the devil and temptation here in just a second. Uh, and I, I found her words to be very, very true. When, when I was going, my wife and I, Brooke and I, looking at getting married, doing the marriage prep stuff, and as part of that, going through uh, natural family planning, Evelyn Hart and her husband were actually our teachers for natural family planning, and there, I, she probably didn't remember this, but there was, there was one uh, session where she came in, and she was like a class of, I don't know, 20 people or whatever, so it wasn't just us. One session she came in, and she was like, uh, you know, sometimes the devil just, the devil's just going to work on you, and especially work on you at the moments where you have really good, important, holy, blessed things that you're supposed to be doing. Like, it always seems like right before one of these, teaching one of these NFP classes, Robert and I get into a big fight. We just, we get into a tiff right before a class. And then we feel bad because we're like, well, now we got to go talk about being holy married couple and, <laughs> and natural family planning and how beautiful and gr glorious it is. But right now we really hate each other, you know? <laughs> and so, but I, but I, it, Anyway, that stood out to me, but it's, I found it true in my marriage, I found it true in my ministry as a deacon, I found it true in my work at the diocese, I mean, the, you, you are going into things that you know objectively and during times of, of consolation in your spiritual life, that's really where God is calling you, it's what God is calling you to do, and then, but, but Satan, the great divider, does not want that consolation for us. He wants to take that away and to divide us, and so he's, he will throw in roadblocks and, 
and uh, doubts and questions and concerns, and not in a healthy way, not good doubts or normal questions or concerns, things that rile us up. I always talk with couples in preparation for baptism, getting their little kids baptized. It is, I mean, you can almost bank on it that the day before that baptism or the night before that baptism, there's going to be some family drama. There's going to be or some little issue between you and your spouse. And then you're going to be tempted to go into that baptism of your child totally focused on the family drama or the little annoyance you had with your spouse or whatever it is because the, the, the devil is trying to distract us from what? From that, the most important moment in that child's life, that moment of baptism, right? So for those of you coming up to be baptized, that's going to happen to you. It will happen on some level. There will be some kind of drama or issue or whatever. It may be big, may be very, very small. But it's, it's probably going to happen. Spiritual warfare, we believe, is a, is a real thing. And so it is something to be cognizant of. Those of you looking to come into full communion who are already baptized, it's going to happen to you on some level. There, you know, there will be some kind of drama, some kind of prick of your conscience and not in a good way. You know, not in a good way. But Lent, it kind of segues into Lent, Lent is a, a season of trying to, to detach from things of this world in order to become more attuned to the movements of the Spirit, of the Good Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, okay? So that when we are faced with those kinds of temptations and trials and tribulations, we can see them and recognize them for what they are, all right? And kind of equip ourselves with the tools to do battle with them. And the way I've structured tonight's talk, Living Lent and the Scrutinies, uh, is really to focus on what are the themes in the Sunday Gospel readings throughout the season of Lent, okay? So if you just took the Sunday Gospel readings and mapped them out and just looked at nothing but them and looked at the progression of the themes within those Sunday Gospel readings, you could do a, a huge retreat just based on that. Okay? And they are really the cornerstone teaching points for what Lent is for us as Catholics. There's lots of other things I could talk about for Lent. I mean, living Lent is a, you know, I mean, I could talk a really long time from a lot of different vantage points and perspectives on what that means and what's in the catechism, what's in the tradition of the church, what's in scripture. There's lots of different approaches you could take. I am not pretending to be all exhaustive with this particular approach. But it's just the approach I decided to take because it made the most sense to me. And my hope is it's at least planting seeds to where when you're sitting in Mass this coming Sunday and you hear the Gospel reading, you might think to yourself, oh, that's the reason why this Gospel is in Lent. And then the next Sunday you'll hear the Gospel reading and you might think, oh, I remember Deacon Matt speaking so eloquently <laughs> and convincingly about the importance of that gospel reading and why it matters for Lent, okay? So anyway, that's why I've, I'm hoping that this will continue to pay dividends for you throughout the course of this Lenten season and hopefully in Lenten seasons to come. So, And I'm also happy to share these slides, Patty, if you'll shoot me an email reminder. They are copyrighted. <laughs> no, they're probably not. Anyway, living Lent. So what does Lent mean? Lent uh, literally comes from this old English word, Lenten, meaning springtime, spring season. So for us in the kind of the Anglo-Saxon world, Lent is associated with the springtime, right? So you kind of feel bad for Anglo-Saxons in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> this is their, their fall time, you know. But in any event, we came to call it Lent. Uh, there's plenty of other cultures, like uh, in Italian, it's literally 40 days. In Spanish, I think it's also literally 40 days. I don't remember. But there's lots of different names for Lent, but that's why we call it what we call it in, uh, in English. 40 days. Why do we call it 40 days? So this is a constant point of kind of infighting is a strong term, but there are two ways of looking at this, okay? There are some who would count the 40 days as starting from Ash Wednesday and going to the, uh, the Wednesday before Holy Thursday, okay? And that's leading up to that. That's, 40, that's your 40 days of Lent. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the, kind of the, the triduum is really Thursday night through Sunday, through Saturday night. Those three days are not part of Lent because 
arguably, technically, they are their own liturgical season, okay? But traditionally, for traditionally, the Easter Triduum is considered a part of, of the Lenten season. It's the culmination of the Lenten season, obviously, but Good Friday certainly has a penitential, is the most penitential day of the year. Um, and so if you count from Ash Wednesday all the way up to Easter Triduum, and you don't count the Sundays, the Sundays of Lent, then that's 40 days. And that's, in my opinion, the more traditional way of viewing how do we get to the 40 days, all right? Because every Sunday, even the Sundays in Lent, are little Easter's. Okay? Every Sunday throughout the year is like a little Easter celebration. On Fridays throughout the year, not just in Lent, we are called to abstain from meat or, in the United States, exercise some other form of sacrifice, some other kind of sacrificial offering. So Fridays are always many Good Fridays, and Sundays are always many Easter's, no matter what time of the year. Okay? So in Lent, for example... Uh, who here has, my watch keeps buzzing me because someone's texting me, so I'm taking it off. So someone else is going to have to keep an eye on the time for me. Who here has given something up for Lent? Okay, so, or who here is doing something for Lent? Okay, so, uh, fine. So, getting, I appreciate, as an attorney, I appreciate your fidelity to the meaning of words. So that's good. So who here has either given something up or doing something for Lent? Okay, that's great. There you go. All right. So for those of us who are giving things up or have given something up in a penitential aspect, arguably, you could not do those things or, re- or do those things, whatever. You could not give that up on Sundays in Lent because Sundays in Lent are arguably not part of the 40 days for Lent. And those Sundays really are celebratory days. Even though they're in Lent, they are still many Easter's. So I'm not trying to create loopholes for any of you who gave up chocolate and are really craving chocolate, and you're like, man, now I can have it on Sunday. But I'm just, uh, it's just a little kind of trivial tidbit. I would also say, we got into an argument once with several different priests about this particular point, and one of them finally very, I wasn't arguing, but some others were, uh, one of them stepped in and said, uh, they were like, well, Father, what do you think about this? And he said, he very calmly said, well... I kind of feel like, you know, it's not really an official teaching of the church, and it's just a personal devotion someone chooses to make during Lent, and if you want to take Sundays off, you can choose to do that. That's kind of between you and God. And I was like, we were all like, well, golly, that makes a lot of sense, I guess. I mean, when you put it so bluntly. So anyway, that's just a brief, I just kind of wanted to say something about the 40 days and how we calculate that. Lent is really supposed to also be like a retreat, spiritually. I try to approach it like a little mini spiritual retreat. What does retreat literally mean? It's from this Latin word which literally means to withdraw or pull back. So your armies are advancing forward in battle and they retraho, they retreat, they pull back or they withdraw. All right? So a retreat is meant to be withdrawing from kind of the normal way of doing life. And we don't all have the opportunity to go away on a three-day retreat every year or a five-day retreat every year or, you know, an eight-day or a 30-day retreat. Most of us, especially if you have, you know, kids that are still at home or dependents or whatever, you, maybe large chunks of time where a retreat is a, is a non-starter. But Lent for us as Catholics is a built-in way to have kind of a retreat experience. Because it forces us, in a good way, forces us to withdraw ourselves from some aspect of our everyday normal routine lives, okay? Is it really that hard, really, is it really that hard to just eat all-you-can-eat catfish on Fridays (laughs) as opposed to having meat? Is that really that hard? No. But there are no days during the year where I want a steak more than on Fridays (laughs) in Lent. Like it's some, you know, it's something about it. Fridays in Lent, it's you want more what you know you cannot have, right? And so it's really not, especially in Arkansas, it's not that hard to just do fish on Fridays or no meat on Fridays. Are, are any of us really suffering? I mean, how many people will go to Bonefish up in the street here for Friday night dinner? I'm not 
criticizing those decisions, but it's not exactly a cheap meal, right? I mean, it's, it's not all, but it is a practical way of at least reminding ourselves, maybe not, everybody okay? I want to make sure that wasn't like a tornado siren is mostly what I was concerned about. But it is some active way, okay, of telling ourselves we are set apart, we are different. In the Old Testament, all right, God calls uh, his people out of slavery, right? And he says, you are, whole, you are a holy nation. What does holy mean? In the, holy literally means to be set apart. You are different. And so the Israelites, the Jews, were given all of these uh, dietary laws and restrictions, lots of different rules in the Old Testament, right? Those rules had a purpose, to set them apart as being different. And so for us as Catholics, during Lent, we have those certain rules. You don't eat meat on Fridays, go into a long historical and spiritual reflection on the meaning and purpose behind that. Um, But we do things different during Lent because we are a holy nation, we are a holy church, a holy people, and it binds us not only closer to God, but closer to one another, okay? So in in Lent, we Catholics, we just do things a little bit different, all right? And uh, once you've done it a little while, it just becomes like, it becomes a habit, it becomes part of who you are, all right? The important thing in living Lent, I I do think all Catholics would benefit, not necessarily from hearing just me ramble on about it uh, at the beginning of every Lent, but listening to somebody kind of really think through, why are we doing what we're doing at the beginning of Lent? We're not just giving up chocolate for the sake of giving up chocolate. We're not abstaining from meat for the sake of abstaining from meat, so on and so forth. The readings have a purpose. Everything has a purpose during Lent. And so tonight, I want to pray and reflect with you guys through why, what those purposes are. So Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday starts us in Lent. Okay, How many of y'all went to Mass on Ash Wednesday? You know, Ash Wednesday is one of those year, days of the year that it's not a, uh, a holy day of obligation. It might be the most well-attended Mass of the year. It's crazy. I tell people, we should, you know, we will give you ashes every Sunday if you'll come. <laughs> I mean, just show up. Well, I'll get you ashes. If it's ashes on the forehead that are really what's drawing you in, we can make that happen. I mean, seriously. I, I don't, but anyway, you walk away with ashes on the forehead. There's something about that reminder, though, that concrete reminder, you are dust, and to dust you shall return, right? So the gospel reading on Ash Wednesday is uh, from, go- from the gospel of Matthew. Jesus is talking about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. So the question I asked first, how many of y'all gave something up or are doing something for Lent? All right, everybody has something. And that's kind of the, folk, the general focal point that people think about. What are you giving up this year or what are you doing this year? But really the spiritual focal point in Lent are these three cornerstones of spirituality. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And Jesus' point in this gospel is not, hey, you should do these three things. That's a, that's a given for Jesus and for the Jews. That's a presumed thing. You will be praying, fasting, and almsgiving, giving alms. Jesus' focal point here in this gospel reading is don't do it for show. Okay? When you pray, go to your secret room and pray in secret. Don't stand on a, a street corner praying as many Pharisees, Sadducees would do. Uh, making a show of themselves ostentatiously, showing everybody, look how much I'm praying, all right? When you fast, do not look dour and sad and down and go around telling everybody how much you're fasting, what I've given up. You know, I, I, have, I have people, I have friends that refuse to tell anybody what they've given up for Lent, which I think is kind of a neat practice because they're trying to, they're trying to kind of keep that between them and God, all right? So when you fast, whatever it is you've given up, whatever it is, don't go around moaning about it all the time, okay? I walked in here, Patty tried to give me a bunch of sweets, you know? I gave up sweets for Lent this year. I haven't done that in a little while, actually. So, but anyway, I gave up all sweets for Lent. Did I say to her, Patty, let me tell you, <laughs> I gave up sweets for Lent, and I'm hating it. I'm hating life right now, and you are tempting me And look how good and holy and strong I am to push back that temptation. No, I didn't say that. I just said, no, no, thanks. I I don't remember what I said, but but I didn't say the first thing. I know I didn't do that, okay? 
So when we fast, don't look gloomy. When we give alms, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing, right? Okay? It doesn't necessarily need to be literal, okay? When you give, uh, when you give money to Christ the King Catholic Church, you, get, you don't have to give it recorded, but if you do, then at the end of the year, you get a tax letter saying you've given X amount to Christ the King, and that's tax deductible, and so you're not, it would be literally impossible for you to slide $5 this way and tell this hand, you don't know what's going on. I mean, that, we'd be worried about your mental health, okay? So, but the point of it, the point of it is to give uh, without expecting anything in return and without expecting any attention as a result, all right? Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. That sets the tone in Ash Wednesday. Those three things are really the foundation for what living Lent is, okay? So if any one of those is lacking, we're not really living Lent the way we should be. It's not enough to just give up chocolate for Lent. That's not living Lent, all right? That's maybe part of it, but am I praying differently during Lent in some way, shape, or form? Am I fasting differently during Lent? Am I giving alms? Am I giving charitable giving in some way, shape, or form differently during Lent? Should be, um, obviously, you want to be doing this all throughout the year, okay? That's not like an only Lent time thing. And then after Lent, no more alms giving. But during Lent, we're called to do it a little bit differently. Like those, uh, what's the, Operation Rice Bowls? You know, those things get passed out, right? The little cardboard box, everybody's puts in their spare change in those. The, you know, those don't collect a ton of money from my family, but it's a visual reminder for the kids during Lent, oh, I've got a spare quarter here. Let me throw that in there, okay? Giving alms some, in some way a little bit differently during Lent. First Sunday of Lent, the gospel reading for that first Sunday, it comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, which I think I actually put in the slides. I did. So this is from the first Sunday of Lent. This would have been last Sunday, right? Last Sunday, okay? So Jesus goes off into the desert to be tempted for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. So the first Sunday of Lent, that's what we're doing. That's what Lent is. You're retreating, you're withdrawing from the world in some way, shape, or form for 40 days. So we are trying to literally follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ during these 40 days, spiritually. And he's going into the desert, what? To be tempted. So Patty talked about, you're going to be tempted. There's going to be some, something from the devil coming at you as you approach the Easter Vigil and Easter Sunday. And that's not, just because, that's not just because you are looking at getting baptized or you're looking at becoming Catholic. That's because you're looking at withdrawing from the world and growing closer to our Lord. Okay? Anybody going through this spiritual season of Lent, trying to draw closer to our Lord, is going to be tempted by the devil. And so this first temptation, this, this verse of Scripture has always confounded me. I always feel like maybe they're mocking us, a little bit of mockery. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. It's like, well, no duh. I mean, I mean, I, I mean was he going to not be hungry? I don't, I don't even know why that's... Anyway, but afterwards he was hungry. Most people wouldn't have been, apparently, but Jesus was. So, afterwards he was hungry. So, he was tempted then to turn stones into loaves of bread. What does Jesus respond with, uh, with each of these temptations? Scripture, right? The Word of God. It is written, one does not live on bread alone. One does not live on bread alone. So, fasting. What kind of fasting are we doing this Lent? Then, take him to a high city. Commands, command, you can command your angels to support you up. Jesus says, you ne- shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I was listening to a podcast recently reflecting on this very Sunday readings and how it actually mirrors the testings and the wanderings going on of the Israelites in the desert. If they were freed from slavery, before they reached the promised land, how long did they wander in the desert? Forty years. Okay, long time. All right. And while they were wandering in the desert, what did they do a lot of? They tested the Lord, right? So when they were in the desert, they had these 
longings for what they called the flesh pots of, of Egypt. So they were out in the desert, and they were kind of getting hungry, and they would murmur, they would grumble to Moses, right? And they would say to him, why did you bring us out of here just to die in this desert? And we had these flesh pots in Egypt when we were slow. We had flesh pots. We had all, all you could eat flesh, all right? Now, do you think that slaves in Egypt actually had flesh pots? I mean, I mean that's possible, but it's, it's really one of those grass is always greener type things. And now all of a sudden you've got freedom. You've got freedom and liberation, but you long for the comforts of that enslavement, okay? For them, literal enslavement. For us, spiritual enslavement, all right? And so when we get liberated from those things, we often look back on our time of enslavement on what is binding us up, and we think, man, that was really good. It was a lot better off back then. It was a lot better off back then. And so what do we do? We, we tell God, man, I was, I was better off back then than when you were in my life. Why don't you make things better for me now? What are we doing when we do that? to our Lord. We're testing, we're testing God. And so Jesus, in, res- in response to this particular temptation, is really saying, it's not about longing for what I've given up. It's putting my trust in God, positively, putting my trust in God. So during Lent, we give things up, in part to withdraw from the world, in part to be drawn out of our slavery, our spiritual enslavement to whatever those things might be in our lives that bind us from really being closer to God. But when we're drawn out of those things, Satan is going to come in and is going to tell you, you were better off back then. You were really happier back then. You were really happier when you were addicted to X, Y, or Z, whatever the case may be. That's what the divider, the evil one, does. And so in those 40 years in the desert, did the, did the Israelites just get to the promised land like that? No, it took time. It took time for them to be detached through that process of withdrawal from all that was previously binding them down, okay? The final temptation in the desert for Jesus, uh, one of pride and power. And his response, the Lord your God alone you shall worship, him alone shall you serve. Again, quoting scripture. And then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Okay, note, now Jesus is the word of God, okay, obviously, so uh, this analogy falls a little bit flat, but notice what Jesus does. Does Jesus use his own words in fighting the devil? He, I mean, he could have, he was the word of God, right? I mean, he, he could have made up whatever he wanted, but he quotes scripture. He quotes Old Testament scripture, word of God, in part, I think, to teach us, listen, when you're faced with with, with the devil, with temptation and the devil, don't make up your own words. You know, don't make up your own reasons to try to argue with that temptation or that evil spirit, whatever it is. Always fall back on the word. Always fall back on the word of God. Second Sunday of Lent is from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. I don't, this is not in there, but it's the transfiguration. So he's starting to go up to Jerusalem, all right? Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he goes up the mountain and is transfigured before his apostles, okay? Let me pull that one up. Matthew 17, did I mark that one? I did. So Jesus goes up, and this is what he says to, this is what he says to Peter, James, and John. Tell no one of the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And then they ask him, why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He replied, Elijah does does come and he is to restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will suffer at their hands. Okay? So in in the midst of this transfiguration, this glorification of Jesus Christ, where they see what is going to come, in the big picture, he also talks about suffering. We are on our way in this Lent towards Easter. There is going to be great rejoicing at Easter. How many of y'all are planning on going to the Easter vigil? I mean, that Easter vigil, that's one of the most powerful liturgies you'll ever go to if you'll you know, give yourself over to it. 
You've got darkness, then all of a sudden you've got one candle, and then those candles light other candles, then all of a sudden the whole church is illumined by these candles, the music, the readings, everything is so powerful in that Easter vigil, okay? So you've got that sense of transfiguration being called out of darkness into the light. But even in the midst of the transfiguration reading, what does Jesus talk about? In order for me to attain this, my transfiguration, there will be great suffering. I've often wondered why, and I, I'm preaching to myself when I say this, okay? Why we think we can attain any kind of glory from God in this lifetime without there being suffering if that wasn't the path for Jesus. You know? Jesus suffered greatly in ways most of us will never be able to experience. His apostles, almost all of them, were martyred, killed for the faith. Most of us will not experience that. Okay? And yet during Lent, frankly, I look at, oh man, I really crave chocolate today. Life sucks. You know? Why do I not get to have chocolate today? God, why are you doing this to me? As if that's like a big deal in the grand scheme of things. And yet that's another reminder for me, hey, I've got an attachment here. I've got something that's, that's, that I'm attached to in a way that's, that's not fully of God. How can I give that over to God so that I can one day be transformed, transfigured like Jesus Christ? Okay? The scrutinies are the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays. We call them scrutinies because it's an opportunity to examine things a little bit more closely in our lives. So it, they're geared towards the catechumens, but they will be, should be the readings for all of us. They're an opportunity for all of us to enter more deeply into the season of Lent as well, even if you're not a catechumen, but just letting you know they're geared towards catechumens. That's the whole purpose of them. So the first scrutiny is Jesus is the living water. It's a story from John chapter 4. He goes up to the Samaritan woman, right? Samaritan woman says, he says to the Samaritan woman, give me some water. She's like, hey, you can't talk to me. Because literally, why are you talking to me? You shouldn't, we're, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, it shouldn't be happening. And Jesus says, I'm the living water, and so on and so forth, right? Okay? So this is the little segment I want to focus on tonight. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give, checking my time, I'm good. Will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So that's from the gospel reading. Now for those of you who are going to be going through the actual scrutiny that day, there's like additional prayers that the priest does over the catechumens. All right? So I want to dive into what those are. I mean, you could, you could do serious meditation and prayer time just on the church's liturgy, on the words in the church's liturgy. So this is out of that prayer. God of power, you sent your son to be our savior. Grant that these elect who like the woman of Samaria thirst for living water. We all thirst for living water. That we might turn to the Lord as they hear his word, acknowledge the sins and weaknesses that weigh them down. Protect them from vain reliance on self. So we all have sins and weaknesses that weigh us down. And we all have vain reliance on self. Okay, We think we can do it all especially as Americans, right? We're all like rugged individualism. I got this. I don't need any help, especially for us men, right? I'm a man. I don't need to rely on anybody. I'm do it myself, chop down the wood and build my house. And feed. You know, there's the individual ruggedness. That is not me. I'm not handy <laughs> or anything. I pay the people who know how to do those things because I cannot, all right? with all the amazing amount of money that I get from the church. So, <laughs> But anyway, we all have that vain reliance on self where we think this life is my own, I can do it, I don't need help, I don't want help, whether from other people or from God. But that doesn't get us freedom, freedom from the spirit of deceit. Admitting the wrong they have done, that we may attain purity of heart and advance on the, on the way to salvation. So the only way, ironically, we get to that freedom is by dying to ourselves. The only way that we get to that kind of freedom in the Lord is by admitting what wrong we have done. We don't attain true freedom by ignoring our wrongs and saying, I'm really a pretty good person. I mean, I mean I'm pretty awesome. And uh, 
anybody who thinks I've done something wrong, uh, they're probably wrong. They probably, they're, probably, they're probably wrong themselves, right? But we all, all of us, have that part of us that wants to think that, okay? So in this prayer, trying to become free from that spirit of deceit, one of the principal parts is admitting the wrong we've done. So we had the whole series just recently on confession, right? Lord Jesus is continuing on in this prayer. Jesus is the fountain for which we thirst. In your presence, they dare not claim to be without sin. If any of us dare claim to be perfect or without sin, we don't need a Savior, and we're, we're, that's, that's step number one, okay? What's step number one of, of, uh, of a lot of addiction recovery issue, uh, programs, okay? I've got a problem. There's a God. I've got a problem. I can't do this on my own, right? I don't know if that's actually step number one, but it's however they number the steps. That's like foundational, right? That's a foundational point, Okay? That's biblically based. Continuing on with this prayer, they open their hearts to faith, they confess their faults, they lay bare their hidden wounds. In your love, free them. There's that notion of freedom again. Free them from their infirmities, heal their sickness, quench their thirst, and give them peace. In the power of your name, which we call upon in faith, stand by them now and heal them. Rule over that spirit of evil, conquered by your rising from the dead. Show your elect the way of salvation, the Holy Spirit, that they may come to worship the Father in truth. Okay? So we're going through Lent, not because the church wants to control us more, but because the church wants to give us the tools to give up our freedom, what we think is freedom, so that we may live truly free in Jesus Christ. The second scrutiny, which is the fourth Sunday of Advent, Jesus heals the blind man. Okay? So this notion, again... Bigger picture notion of light and darkness. Jesus bringing people out from the darkness into the light or bringing light into the darkness to overcome the darkness. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see might see. Those who do see might become blind. Those are powerful, powerful words. Those who do see might become blind. So for those of us who think... I see perfectly. I got it all figured. I'm, I'm good to go. That's a problem. And we all are fooling our, ourselves if we don't think that there's some part of us that is like that in some area of our lives. Okay? So Jesus, this Lent, especially this fourth Sunday of Lent, is calling us out of that darkness and into the light. Here's the prayer for that fourth scrutiny. Father, you led the man born blind to the kingdom of light. Free the elect from the false values that surround and blind them. Set them firmly in your truth, children of light forever. You could pray a whole day long. What are the false values that surround and blind me? I got false values all over the place that surround and blind me. Whether it's our culture, our secular culture, our American culture, whether it's my own pride, if it's my own concupiscence, my own issues, whatever the case may be, we're all surrounded by false values, okay, that we need to be freed from. Jesus, you are the true light that enlightens the world. Free those enslaved. There's that notion of freedom from slavery again. All those dynamics of being freed from captivity in Egypt, wandering the desert for 40 years into the promised land, but grumbling all along the way. Because we want that freedom, but we don't like what it takes to kind of get there. Let them rejoice in your light that they may see, and like the man born blind whose sight you restored, let them prove to be staunch and fear, fearless witnesses to the truth. So important here, the man born blind, often, this happens often in the Gospels, okay? Jesus heals someone and says, don't tell anybody. Don't, don't do it. Do not say anything to anybody, right? And what do they do? They go over and tell everybody, okay? Because if our lives are really radically transformed by Christ, we should not be able to help but share that with other people. We should, now, I am not naturally an extrovert. This may shock you, but I'm not. And I'm not naturally like a salesperson. If I was, had to do, go into sales as a job, I would be 
bankrupt. I'm, I, you know, I try to sell something to somebody, and they're like, you know, I don't know that I really want that. I'd be like, you're right, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have annoyed you with this, I apologize. I would be terrible, okay? But when it comes to our faith, evangelizing isn't a sales pitch, all right? Evangelizing isn't about whether you're an extrovert or an introvert. Evangelizing is, has your life, at least on some basic level, been fundamentally, radically transformed by Jesus Christ? And if so, there's a darkness inside of us that is not there any longer because light has been brought in. And if light's been brought in, man, you cannot help but share that with other people on some level because then you see darkness in somebody else's life and you're like, let me tell you about you know, Jesus. Let me tell you about hope. Let me tell you about love. Let me just at least show you hope and love, even if I'm not going to preach to you. Let me find a way to bring light into your life. All right? So we're all born blind. Our sight is all restored in some way. But that calls us then to be witnesses, to be witnesses to the faith, not just hold it to ourselves. The third scrutiny, on the fifth Sunday, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus leads us again from death to new life. Here are some key words from this very long reading, which I will not read to you here tonight, but it's, it's a long one. Jesus wept. I think it might be the shortest verse in the, gospel, in the scriptures. Jesus, and Jesus wept. I mean, you think of just how powerful that is. Jesus, the Son of God, whose friend died and who... He knew in his omniscience he could raise from the dead, and in fact did. But yet that close experience connection with death, losing a friend, he wept. My dad died at age 57. He died 14 years ago now. Okay, That's, that's still hard for me, but it was certainly hard for me in the years right after he died. Never met my my kids, never met his grandkids. We all have mourning and grief and trauma in our lives. There is not a single moment of weeping or mourning or grief or trauma that Jesus has not related to and cannot relate to because he chose to enter into that with us. Jesus wept at the passing of his friend Lazarus. So when I'm weeping or grieving some trauma, Jesus is right there with me weeping along with me. Jesus is not saying to me, you know, this really isn't that bad. It's really not that, because, you know, you got heaven coming, you know, so you should be happy, in fact. You, you should be happy, okay? All that, all that may be objectively true, objectively and theologically accurate true, right? Heaven, bigger picture, grand scheme of things, all true. But yet Jesus even wept. Jesus mourned and wept. Jesus says, take away the stone. These three lines, you could spend, I don't know, five minutes or 30 minutes or an hour just sitting down and praying through these three lines, hearing Jesus say them to you. Take away the stone. What stone is it that's binding me up in my own sarcophagus, in my own grave, in my own attachment to death and sin? Take away the stone. And then he says, Lazarus, come out. So you might pray through, think through. I'm entering into that scene. I'm bound up in whatever's holding me back from living more fully in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says to me, Matt, come out. Come out of there. I hear him say that to me. And how does that make me feel? No, guys, that's a tough one, you know, feelings. You know, but, but how does that make me feel? to hear Jesus call my name and say, come out, come out of there. And then says to other people, untie him and let him go. So notice this isn't just a me and Jesus thing. There's a church, there's a communal aspect to it. So Lazarus doesn't take away the stone himself. Other people help take away that stone, right? So what stones are we also being called to take away for others, to help remove for others? We talk about untying Lazarus and letting him go. Man, how oftentimes do we tie other people down? With guilt trips, with burdens, with uh, 
uh, grudges, whatever it may be, we tie other people down all the time. Maybe our own sinfulness, our own bad habits have led other people into sin, and we've tied them down through that. How, how are we being called to untie others? But then also, we've been tied up. We've got to let other people help us. We have to be willing to let other people untie the bonds that have been tied on us because we can't do it ourselves. Jesus didn't say to Lazarus, all right, untie yourself, right? Because he was tied up. Jesus says to him, untie him and let him go. So this is the prayer after that third scrutiny. Father of life, of life. Jesus came to bring us life. God, not of the dead, but of the living. Sent your son to proclaim life. There's that word again. To snatch us from the realm of death. I love that line. Snatch us from the realm of death. Lead us to the resurrection. Free these elect. And again, I would say not just the elect. This is really for all of us. From the death-dealing power of the spirit of evil. Lead them to their new life in the risen Christ. Lord Jesus, by raising Lazarus from the dead, you showed that you came, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. That does not mean we will not suffer. That does not mean life will be perfectly hunky-dory all of the time. And it, is not, it does not mean that. In fact, Jesus said to his apostles, go forth and spread the gospel and the good news. By the way, uh, people are going to mock you and make fun of you and call you bad names and probably kill you, and it's going to be really hard. But he said that to people that had seen him risen from the dead and saw him conquer death. And so at that point, I often think about that. If I, if I had seen, had been there when Jesus rose from the dead and those apostles that saw that, does it really matter what you do to me? After that, when, I, when you have that level of conviction that eternity is real, everlasting life is really, really, really real, Jesus really has conquered death, and does it really matter what, what you do to me? It doesn't really matter, right? Praying through those witnesses of the martyrs of our faith, that's powerful stuff. Going on with this prayer, free them from the grasp of death, those who await your life-giving sacraments. Again, pointing to the elect, but all of us, it's important and good to remember the life-giving aspect of those sacraments, okay? So questions that maybe you could ask yourself, pray over, that I had beautifully formatted just for tonight, <laughs> and I'd print it off, but we're not going to print them. But I'm going to send these slides out to Patty, and, and you might think and pray through these questions um, in the weeks to come. How can I better retreat from the world during these 40 days of Lent, okay? How can I withdraw, pull back from the world? Yeah, what? Oh, yeah. Or if you have questions, I'm open to questions too. Okay, Matt, go on. <laughs> what weaknesses, what sins and weaknesses do I thirst to be freed from? So you're talking about Jesus, that gospel story about being, I'm the, I'm the, uh, the life-giving water. You drink from my water, you'll never thirst. So there's sins and weaknesses that there, I have to have some thirst to be freed from. What are those? Jesus can't heal them until, unless we are open and admit those to him. What false values are blinding and binding me, preventing me from fully seeing the light of Jesus Christ? So we all have false values. I don't mean to get too heady or philosophical, but it's important. It is critically important, especially in our current cultural environment, secular culture, that we be attuned consciously to the values that we surround ourselves with, okay? We, I tell this to my kids all the time about their friends. You can tell whether or not your friends influence you. you. You are going to be influenced by your friends, but you can help, you can choose what friends you surround yourself with, okay? So choosing the right friends is pretty darn important for our formation. Same thing with values. Uh, I was listening to someone else talk about the other day about uh, the principle of garbage in, garbage out, okay? If I 
inhale a bunch of garbage in my values. I'm flipping through Facebook and Instagram, and I'm just consuming things that, you know, maybe they're not even bad, but I'm just constantly consuming, and I think, oh, if I just watch one more Instagram reel, then I'll be happy tonight. Oh, there's one more. Oh, that one was really funny. Let me keep going. Oh, there's another one. Why would I stop now, right? I mean, maybe, okay, I've, I've never done that, but I've, I've, heard, I've heard that people can do that, okay? Whatever it is, though, all right, whatever it is, we, we choose to surround ourselves with values. Some of it we can't help. Some of the culture that we're in, we're in. And, but a lot of it we can. A lot of it we can proactively put not garbage in, garbage out, but virtue in and virtue out. If we put garbage in, it is no doubt that all of a sudden we're going to have real spiritual trials, tribulations, issues, doubts, concerns, because we've surrounded ourselves with junk. You know, you got pe- I got people come to me having real issues with faith and doubt and concerns. You know, when's the last time you just picked up the Bible and just, just read a little scripture? I never do that. I just, I get all my stuff from cable news and I try to follow Twitter and uh, I'm on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, don't do it. Okay? It's too late for me. <laughs> but I'm just, just don't do it. But... But man, we, we've got to, in some ways, fake it till you make it almost, you know? I mean, we've got to surround ourselves with good, virtuous stuff that we know instinctively is good, even if we're not connecting with it. And then eventually, that it's virtue in and then virtue out, instead of garbage in, garbage out. And then the final question I got here is, when I hear Jesus call my name, what will be that impact, being called out from darkness into the light? Those things... I mean, you could pray on, again, just these words from this Gospel of John and that fifth Sunday of Lent. That could be your whole Lenten theme, for example, spiritually. You could think through that every day. So anyway, those are my ideas for how to live Lent. And I've gone, I've rambled for an hour, almost an hour now, so I'm going to take questions or comments or whatever. Yeah, another prayer, thank you. Another prayer idea, you mentioned the scrutiny prayers. <clears throat> there are these uh, prayers called the collects uh, of Mass, the collects. It's the opening prayer of Mass, okay? And during Lent, the opening prayer of Mass is different every day. Most of you probably don't have a Roman Missal, you can't look at it, but you can find the collects online, the opening prayers online. And are there in, are there in, and do they all have that book? Man, I'm telling you, during Lent, those collects, I don't want to dissuade anybody from doing like reading the daily scriptures or the daily gospels, whatever. But those daily collects alone, the opening prayers during Lent, those things are rich. And they're short, you know, they're not super long. That could be like a daily prayer devotional, super easy. And that you're entering then into the church's liturgy. You talk about gar- the opposite of garbage in, garbage out indulging yourself with the church's liturgy is beauty, truth, goodness in. So, Any other comments or concerns or questions? I really love the uh, meditation that John wrote in there. Um, they actually use that they, they use that same meditation in um, Rachel's Vineyard. It's a post-abortive um, healing retreat and um they use that exact meditation Mm -hmm. and imagery and actually physically tie you up not like so you can't get out but (laughs) um it is um an exercise to help you visualize and help you to um really get in touch with what's in your heart and um let the light in and uh sorry i got a little emotional if anybody saw me (laughs) over here i'm just like that anyway matt knows that (laughs) um but it really is the most beautiful way 
to allow um, Jesus to touch your life and to uh, really let the light in. So please take him seriously. Try that. Um, just put yourself in a, in a dark room and um, allow that passage to, to just envelop you and then um, just see what happens. It, it's really, it's, it's groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? As I roll up my sleeves, I'm going to get to work now. <laughs> just getting, just getting stuffy, getting hot. So, Got yeah. A uh, generally, it's on subjects, not specifically on what we've discussed tonight. But I'm, it just came to me for some reason. I'm curious if you know or any of the others may know. When you go through RCIA, what percentage of the people who come and attend this for six or seven months become Catholic? Uh, you want my just flippant answer? Yeah. My yeah. flippant answer, which is very condescending, and so don't quote me on this even though I'm being recorded. All of them. <laughs> is, well, you know, when we get to heaven... I mean, fullness of the truth. Yeah. I mean, we're planting seeds here. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, people may not become Catholic at the end of this, you know, RCIA process. And they may not become Catholic this year. They may not become Catholic at any point in their earthly lives. But do I think that we're planting seeds to where that fullness of the truth will be fully realized in heaven? We call that Catholic. And we're all universal church in that sense, yes. But from this, that's a flippant answer. But uh, but from a percentage standpoint, I wouldn't know. Yeah, I I wouldn't. I don't know what the statistics are on how many people become Catholic versus dropping out, so to speak. Or. Andrew, do you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say. I would say at least 99.9%. And so, no pressure. No pressure. But if you leave, if you leave, we know where you live now. And it could be a problem. Just saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, the Catholic guilt never goes away. We don't mess around with guilt. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Why don't we close with, good to close with prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time here tonight to pray and reflect on the meaning and purpose of Lent in our lives, for the church, for all Christians, for all of us who are called to become closer to your Son. During these 40 days, we ask you to just keep stripping away from us those things that we are attached to, maybe showing us even more the things that that we are attached to, that maybe we don't even really recognize how attached we are or even that we're attached to them right now. Father, we ask that you would give us the courage to step out into that scary territory of freedom and liberation, knowing and trusting that you have a plan for our lives. And that plan is not just for life, but to have life more abundantly. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.